Um, hello, everyone. I just want to do an audio text. My name's Henriette. I'm your moderator. Um, Clara, Nigat, can we just... David, I think you are online. Do you want to unmute or so we can hear you? Hear if you are... Easy for us to hear. Clara, please go ahead, say something. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Very clearly. <laughs> Nigat? Um, let's see. Can you unmute Nigat Dat, please? Oh, yeah, that's right, you unmuted. Go ahead, Nigat. Anyway, I'm so sorry, my internet connection was bad. I actually missed your uh, I just question. wanted to I just wanted to do an audio check to see if we can hear you oh, clearly. Now and you can, can hear me. And we can. Thanks a lot. Okay, we'll start in a few minutes. We'll start at one o'clock on the dot, Japan time. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Disinformation from an Internet Governance Perspective workshop. Um, my name is Henriette Esterhuisen, and I'll be moderating. I'm a senior advisor, um, internet governance at the Association for Progressive Communications. I'll introduce you to our very diverse and very interesting panel as we do the workshop. But I actually, at this point, because we're a small group of people, I want to ask you all to stand up because we're going to start with an interactive ex exercise, Professor, mm -hmm. that includes you. So just stand up and line up. I'm gonna make a statement. And then I'm going to ask you to position yourself, I mean, along this corridor and that corridor, more or less, on that side of the room, if you strongly agree with the stat statement, towards this side, if you strongly disagree, and then somewhere in the middle, according to how strongly you agree or disagree. So the statement is, absolutely you. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not gonna get a chance to speak. Um, um, mis disinformation is undermining democracy. If you agree, go towards that end. Disagree, somewhere around here. And somewhere in the middle. And the idea is as other people speak, I'm gonna ask people why they stand where they stand. Then think about it, reflect, and decide whether you want to move along this imaginary spectrum. And also, that's how we gain new friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, <laughs> Bill Drake, you have to. Then you have to stand in the middle. This information undermines democracy. Okay, so I'm going to start over there with somebody who's right on the other side. Um, let's, anybody willing to, why? Why do you agree so strongly with this? And just introduce yourself and then say why. Um, hi, I'm Greta. Um, hmm. I think it's hard to explain, but the feeling that there is information outside that can but how our, yeah, how democratic institutions work and function or, yeah, really. <laughs> so you feel that, the, that misinformation can actually undermine the institutions of democracy. Anyone else here who feels strongly? Hello, uh, hello my name is uh, Remy Milan. Um, the reason I would say undermining is that mis or disinformation undermines citizens' confidence in the institutions of the state. And that's probably what I view as the sort of highest level danger. So remember, you're supposed to move if he's moved you. 
So let me move to that side of the room, because I haven't seen anyone move yet. Um, Jeanette, why don't you tell us, you're one of our speakers, so introduce yourself. Why are you standing at this side? Why do you disagree? Um, but then I sort of, uh, I anticipate what I'm going to say. All I wanted to say, one of the main things I want to say is that while we have a lot of research on generation and circulation of disinformation, we know little, if not nothing, about how it actually affects people's minds and people's voting behavior. A lot of what we see here discussed is sort of based on assumptions, but not on empirical evidence. Just introduce yourself. Oh, well. I'm one of the speaker, Hang Jeanette on. Hofmann. I'm a political scientist from Germany. Um, anyone, you want to react to that? Qu Good, you're allowed to. You disagree with Jeanette. I, I would say, uh, since I live in the United States, I would say January 6th uh, was actually a good example of events inspired by mis- and disinformation designed specifically to undermine the democra democratic transfer of power between two governments. That, I think, I watched on TV. I actually believe, believe that I saw something. So mm -hmm. I think there's empirical evidence that people can be driven to act contrary to de democratic institutions by mis- and disinformation. A any of our online participants, including the speakers, who strongly agrees that disinformation undermines democracy? Nigat, Clara, David, Erin? Um, I... Cla 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 go ahead and go ahead and just introduce yourself and then tell me whether you agree or disagree. Yeah, um, no, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Nika Dad and I, um, I run Digital Rights Foundation. I'm speaking from Lahore, Pakistan right now. And I'm like in between agree and in the center. So I, I, was, I was very much agreeing it. And when Janet said, I'm like, okay, I want to a little bit move on to Janice's side because um, we have been saying this over and over again that yes, disinformation, misinformation impacts our democratic processes, but what kind of evidence we have to support actually that and how and, and a very solid evidence in terms of how it basically changes behavior of people during electoral processes and however, we see a lot of impact and effect of disinformation on several institutions and also on voters. But I think we still need to have a solid uh, sort of evidence in terms of, in terms of supporting that yes, it is actually you know deter deteriorating our uh, democracy in our countries. I feel like there's several other aspects that sort of impact uh, uh, this uh, sort of destruction of our democracy processes. Thanks, Nigat. Before Professor Kuwait, before you, you strongly disagree as well. Do, are you willing to share why? Um, I wouldn't say I strongly disagree, like I'm not over there. That's true. Um, I'm sort of slightly to the left of the middle, uh, well, right of the middle, I guess. Um, I think it's, so, uh, I'm from a think tank, we do some work in this area. I think my background is also legal. Um, and I frequently find it quite difficult to settle on a definition of disinformation. And then I think there's a whole separate question of how we actually apply that definition. And I think a lot of people are thinking of different things when they, they say they're thinking about disinformation. I also think the sort of longitudinal impact is something that's very hard to assess. And I think when we think about um, the causative impact of disinformation, it's very hard to extract substantive um, grievance from it. So is it a manifestation of people's dissatisfaction with the way society is that we can now observe and measure in ways that we couldn't in the past? Or um, is it the disinformation that is sort of causing that dissatisfaction? I think that's a hard thing to unpick. Okay, so the unknown. So those of you that, that came late, um, I made a statement, I said disinformation is undermining democracy, and the idea is that people who disagree are kind of over here, and people who agree are over there.
Bill Drake, you're one of our speakers. Please introduce yourself. And what is your position? Why are you in the middle? That's not actually very common for you. I've known you for many years, and you, you very, very rarely sit on any fence. Bill Drake, Columbia University. Hi. Uh, because I, as I've said before, when we, we had a session about this at the Taiwan IGF last week, beware of false binaries. I think you, when you put these things into simple either-or choices, it becomes almost meaningless. The extent to which it impacts democracy and the way it might impact is highly dependent on context, et cetera, et cetera. So I, and I would add to Jeanette that social science ability to do effective polling in here may not be the only possible measure. We have tens of millions of Americans who have demonstrated over and over that they believe in disinformation. So. Um, you see, Bill has made me move a little bit more to the center. Professor Kurwe, you wanted to say something. Introduce yourself. Uh, this is Guo Wei Wu, is the uh, chair of the TWIJ from Taiwan. And just like Bill saying, uh, I have a three point very simple. First of all, disinformation, politicians also, you know, create and uh, this spread the disinformation, not only the news media or the social media. So don't forget that politicians did it too. The second of all is, uh, I don't uh, fully agree about uh, Janet saying, the reason is because uh, she didn't put a time in that coordination, uh, coordinate. Because uh, if you put a time, because uh, when the dis disinformation spread around, don't forget it, the voting is uh, just a second. So in that second, you might be get moved by the disinformation, change yeah. your voting yeah. behavior. It's like Brexit. And then maybe one minute after you regret, but too late, it's done. You know? So it's, it's so exactly this like the, I'm stand in yeah. the middle. <laughs> like the Brexit referendum. So many people regret it. Okay, before we sit down like normal IGF participants with a interesting, we hope, panel on that side and the rest of us on this side. So before we assume the normal divisions of power. Anyone else in this side of the room who agrees strongly that disinformation is undermining um, democracy? Yeah. Uh, my name is Jan Mahob uh, from the Foundation for Media Alternatives uh, from the Philippines. And if you are aware uh, who was our previous president, <laughs> Duterte, and who is our current president, uh, Marcos, the son of the former dictator, uh, I think it would be easier to, to appreciate why uh, civil society at least feels that uh, disinformation plays a huge part uh, in, in as to why our democratic uh, institutions right now and democracy in general is very much uh, in peril, if not already <laughs> uh, uh, gone, <laughs> so to speak. So I can understand though the the, the search for empirical data. I'm also a sociologist and a lawyer, uh, but we live uh, behind the studies. We live uh, through the realities every day, and we've gone through our elections last year, and we saw how much uh, that uh, this information actually impacted people uh, across, not just uh, the, those uh, supposedly in the marginalized sectors, even those who are actually, uh, you would expect to, to uh, are learned uh, individuals, uh, they too were, were very much um, caught into that web, yeah. It's true, but you also did have decades of Marcos dictatorship prior to online disinformation. So, okay, the last word will be from Oh yeah, thank you for giving me some floor. I'm Tim, I'm from Russia. I work for a think tank which is responsible for fighting and countering disinformation and fakes in Russia, so I have some practical experience on that. Uh, so, like, some bad news. Disinformation is, like, inevitable at all because the ability to make a mistake is a natural part of humankind and human brain, actually. So, uh, as far as it goes, Disinformation and fake news are extremely effective weapon. And nowadays, it's widely used as a weapon, and you can get that, in, especially in context of Russian-Ukrainian war. We have an informational war with Ukraine along, and we have lots of 
usage of this weapon like against us. And this last but not least, actually when you fight disinformation, it's never possible to like ground zero all the disinformation and fakes and myth and anything else like this possible. But what you actually do you, is you actually fight the consequences and damage of disinformation and spread of disinformation. But you cannot fight the disinformation itself. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, let's take a seat. Come and sit in the front. Henriette, while well, people are taking a seat, can I Yes, David, you? please go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I wish I was there. It sounds fun, and it's six in the morning where I am, so I I could use the stretch. Um, I so I'm going to be a little bit of the diplomat of David, my David. Just introduce I yourself. Do. Just introduce yourself yeah. to the room. So I'm David Kay. I teach law at the University of California at Irvine. Uh, I was the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression um, from 2014 to 2020, and I'm the independent uh, chair of the board of the Global Network Initiative. And um, the diplomatic thing that I was gonna say is that I agree with what everybody said, um, but the thing, I think there are at least three different issues here that from, a, from an IGF global governance perspective make it very difficult to talk about disinformation. One is it really matters, and this came through in the comments already, I think it really matters who's doing the disinformation. Is it the state? Is it the president? Is it like who's doing it? And also where is it happening? So as far as our, our study and understanding of the impact, I think those things matter. A second thing is what impact do we actually care about? I mean, do we care about whether disinformation has an impact as Jeanette was suggesting on voting behavior? Do we care about the impact that disinformation has on people's action in the street, as in January 6th? Um, you know, what is, it that, what is the thing that we're actually studying? And then third, based on all of those different contextual features, I think it's very, very difficult to say that there's one particular solution that works at a global governance level that would address disinformation in every instance or every context, whether it's in legacy, broadcast, media, print, or on social or search. There's just such variety. So I think that it's, it's just a vast topic that requires nuance and may not be uh, really amenable to a kind of one size fits all response. Thanks very much, David. Um, Clara, do you want to, to um, reflect on this opening statement? And then also please introduce yourself. Thank Tell you, us where you are. Thank you, Anhed. I'm Clara. I'm a legal scholar from Brazil, but I am right now in Berlin, also 6 a.m. here, so mm -hmm. keeping strong. Um, thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to jump right in and say that I think I'm, I'm, uh, I would be alongside David, kind of in the middle, a little bit more on the, on the diplomatic side. And I'll tell you why. I think information can, this information can undermine democracy, uh, depending on context. I'll, I prepare myself to talk a little bit about that, right? So depending on sources, depending on political, social context, what this is, this, disinformation strategies are being pursued, I think they can undermine democracy, but not on the ways that we would instinctively um, think of. So I agree with Jeanette that we don't have solid empirical evidence that this information changed voters' behaviors, for instance. We don't have solid empirical evidence that it changed, changes the results of elections. But I think we do have enough reason to worry about what how exactly it weighs in recent political transformations that we have seen in different contexts. And I think this shows that we need more research on that, on these blind spots that we're not exactly unfolding yet. 
But I will say one thing about the empirical evidence, just to close my first statement, which is this empirical evidence we have nowadays, it's very much focused on the US and Europe. So I would be very happy to see more empirical evidence of how this information unfolds in other political contexts, what we call the global South, but I'm talking Latin America and Africa and Asia. So that would be it for my first uh, input. Thanks very much, Clara. We, we do not yet have um, our, our final speaker, um, Aaron, who was with the Singaporean government recently, he's now moved to academia. I don't think he's with us. I do want to introduce our remote moderator. She's in Nairobi. Rispa, can you just reveal yourself on screen? Put your camera on and say something. I'll see if I can unmute you. Can you unmute Rispa Arose, please? She was there and she might have just dropped off, but she's trying to get hold of Aaron. But let me turn to, to Jeanette and Bill here. I mean, and, and, and David, you can add on this as well, and Nigat. Our opening question to you was not that dissimilar from the question that I, that I asked the room, and that is, um, do you think you can define it? What is disinformation? Is it serious? And if so, why? Uh, this information focuses on strategical uh, intent, meaning uh, the strategical circulation of disinformation with a specific purpose, and that usually is to manipulate people in their behavior and uh, in their worldviews. So that is what disinformation is. But now I'd like uh, to come back to what I said earlier, that we really lack empirical evidence, and I'd like to elaborate a bit on that. We have right now a strong focus in academia on platforms. And while that makes sense, because we get uh, at least some data about the uh, circulation of disinformation, there is also a little problem with that because it cuts off uh, long-standing research traditions that focused already on the question of propaganda, of uh, manipulation and its effects on people's minds. At that time, it was less about platforms and it was more about legacy mass media, but also political propaganda. And I have to say, that there was never agreement on the question of whether it had a long time effect on people. There is a strong opinion in academia saying it's a, the effect is amplifying what people already believe. If you have a tendency uh, to believe in conspiracy theories, you might be open, uh, receptible to disinformation. But if you are immune to that, it might not have much of an effect on you. So there there is the hypothesis called preaching to the choir. Disinformation reaches people who are vulnerable. That's point one. And second one I would like to make is that a lot of research focuses on the individual, but what really matters when it comes to disinformation is the media environment. Countries with a strong tradition of public media, of high quality media, they are able to counter this information much better than countries where the media landscape is a mess. So if we want to learn more about whether or not disinformation works, we need to look beyond platforms and take into account the wider media landscapes. Context matters, and there is no point in only looking at platforms and their algorithms. Um. It's, it's also interesting, I mean, the, the, I, I was just, it just kind of struck me, the remark about the US and then the comment from the Philippines. And maybe there are cultures, media cultures and populist you know, political moments which might also be similar. So there could also be other contextual issues. And Bill, do you want to elaborate on your earlier remarks? 
Um, okay. Well, first of all, on the U.S. case, uh, I think that uh, there have been a lot of studies that have indicated that actually, further to Jeanette's point, a lot of the disinformation is not originally coming from social media, it's coming from broadcast media, uh, and then gets picked up by and amplified by social media. So when we talk about the strength of the traditional media environment being a buttress against the spread of disinformation, you have to recognize in a case like the United States, which has a fairly strong and vibrant media system and has for a long time had multiple voices, well-funded, et cetera, et cetera, that we have three um, networks that are get tens of millions of viewers that are completely all in on disinformation. I mean, <laughs> and who are major proponents of disinformation and who attack anybody who questions disinformation as being somehow trying to suppress freedom of speech and so on. So this goes, so we have a, we have a certain problem in the US, but I, mean, my, I guess the point I would make is, um, you know, between traditional media as the savior and, and platforms as the source of all problems, I th as again, what I said at the outset, it all depends on the context of what we're talking about. On the definitional issue, um, you know, Jeanette said it, we all kind of uh, agree on this. It's actually interesting. I, I was um, looking at some of the different definitions that have been put forward by different leading organizations, and it's amazing how variable they are in their details. Maybe this is because I spent a lot of time in the internet governance space working on the, the definition of internet governance uh, uh, 20 years ago in the UN Working Group and, and so on. But I mean, I, I tend to look at these things and think, why, why are they uh, doing it this way? For example, the European Union uh, descri uh, describes uh, disinformation as the creation, presentation, and dissemination of verifiably false or misleading information for the purpose of economic gain or intentionally deceiving the public. Why economic gain or intentionally deceiving the public? There's, there's different ways of formulating the, the strategic objective there, right? The UN Special Rapporteur in 2022 says, false information that is disseminated intentionally to cause serious social harm. So are you saying that it's only disinformation if it is intended to cause serious social harm and what constitutes serious social harm? So, you know, you can play with the definitions and they, in fact, they, they could be quite messy. Obviously, we, we want a definition and an understanding that captures the notion of intentionality and of verifiable falsity. Um, and we want to uh, capture that there's a strategic dimension in the production and the original uh, creation dissemination. But then again, you have people who recirculate disinformation all the time, not knowing it's disinformation, so then when they do it, it's misinformation, I suppose you would say, right? Because they're not seeking necessarily to cause serious social harm. They, we, their weird uncle sent them this picture uh, saying that, you know, Hillary Clinton is the devil and, and eats babies, and they, they think maybe that's true, and they send it to their friend. So, I mean, you know, is I mean, this is the kind of crazy stuff we have. But I will, back to Jeanette's point, and I'll stop, uh, on the U.S. thing, though. It is true that the social scientists, as, as just to amplify what I said before, social scientists always have trouble demonstrating impact. We have 60-something years of media studies before the Internet where people tried to impact, uh, look at the impacts of media, media effects and how strong or weak they were, did they cause violence, sexual predation, whatever, et cetera. It's hard to get at that through polling data and so on. But when tens of millions of people vote saying that they do so informed by strong disinformation, this, this would seem to be relevant information to me. Okay. So anyway, I thanks, stop. thanks, Bill. Nigat, do you want to add anything to your earlier opening remark on, on the concept and the issue? Yeah, um, so based on my work uh, wearing different hats, uh, you know, someone working in Pakistan, looking at the context, but then someone sitting at Meta's oversight board, I feel that content that is related to mis and disinformation, it's very complex to define it uh, as a mis and disinfo and even more compli complicated to, uh, to identify it. Um, and, and I think definitions are very, very contextual. I mean, some of the definitions Bill uh, mentioned here, and I'm like, 
okay but some you know like actors civil society actors states companies sort of define all these things according to like keeping their interest in mind as well right or the work that they are doing or the context that they belong to but for instance like this information for us how we kind of see it as a you know false content which which is being shared with the intent of causing harm uh but then we cannot assume all untrue information is harmful and we should be very uh, we should be very cautious of you know defining it in a way where uh, especially not the civil society but the powerful actors when they define it that means that they are going somewhere to regulate it right and that's where i see the, the, a problem is so i don't know what else to add here but i feel that it's very contextual uh, if i i don't know how many of you have seen uh, is a unsr's report on gender disinformation which 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 is just released a couple of days ago and it has a context of all the regions uh, and it actually it was mind boggling to see that how disinformation cause uh, uh, causes harm to women and marginalized groups in south asia and how it does it in latin america so i feel like it's it's a, such a good document that people should read it's very recent but at the same time i feel it's contextual but we should be very very cautious when we are defining it and not giving not leaving mm -hmm. a space where mm -hmm. you know like uh, we should basically give space to people to interpret it the way they want to according to their context and how they see their political situation yeah. is thanks nikat just a little plug for um, um, my organization use the igf and this shows how the igf can be really valuable to have a consultation last year in addis ababa with the special rapporteur on gender disinformation and she used the input from that consultation uh, in her report david any any additional points from you i think the only thing that i'd add is that um is to sort of put a, a sort of a legal uh, sort of uh, gloss on all this, which is just to emphasize why definition is so important. Um, if we're talking about ultimately legal regulation, which I think ultimately when we're talking about governance, that's what we're talking about, then we have to be clear about what the issue is. And that's not just some abstract issue. It's also a fundamental component of legality. We need precise definition and then you know precision in what it is that we're actually restricting. And one of my big fears is that even though I share the view that there is a problem called disinformation and there is a wide variety of impacts of disinformation we don't really have clear definition. And we see that, I think, even in the emerging regulations from places in Europe and the UK and elsewhere, because um, what we see there is this move for transparency and risk assessment that assumes that in those cases, platforms will sort of define the issue as they're doing that work. Maybe that's okay, and maybe that will be great evidence for social scientists and, and for legal scholars, but, but I'm afraid we're not at a point where we have shared definitions that are clear enough for legal mm -hmm. regulation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, David. Jeanette, you want to react? Um, yeah, I wanted to address the question of motives, because many people, of course, for good reasons, refer to distinct episodes like the attack uh, after the last election in the US on, um, on the White House. Um, empirical research shows that many people who act on disinformation and share disinformation do not necessarily believe that this is the truth. One reason why people share this information is to signal belonging, to express their loyalty to a certain way of thinking and acting. So many people say Republicans who now share information about the last election being stolen might not necessarily believe this. What they are expressing is their loyalty, their belief in Trump and this sort of uh, crowd of Republicans. And 
we even have evidence that when people are asked, do you believe what you are sharing, that they might not tell you the truth. And this brings me to an aspect that I find actually alarming. It's less the amount of disinformation, but there is a growing amount of people in various countries who do not care any longer about the distinction between truth and falsity. For them, political belonging, let's call it tribal, um, tribal attitudes, are becoming so strong that they are more important than whether or not there is a truth to strive for. And that is what I think undermines public discourse and therefore democracy. Um, thanks, um, thanks, Jeanette. Clara, I hear, I can see you also want to react. Go ahead. Yes, thank you so much, Henriette. Um, just a sec, Vaifi, my kid's waking up. Um, <laughs> Tell them uh, to make you coffee. Yeah, unfortunately, not possible yet, but soon. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree there's this um, conceptual inconsistency. So, we have a lot of definitions more on the media and communications uh, disciplines as one of the many communicational phenomena that comes alongside misinformation, propaganda, fake news. I think I, I actually like distinguishing things by intention. It makes all the difference for the law. Uh, we often run into social science scholars or communication scholars say, oh, but you can tell much about intent when in fact intent uh, holds up a a, 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 a big chunk of legal relevance, right? Um, but what I do want to say is that beyond being a communication practice or being a, a sort of online harm, which is also another way in, in which we refer to disinformation a lot, I think we need more definitions or more efforts to conceptualize disinformation um, within political theory, uh, within um, political practice, right? So I think it functions a lot as a form of political intervention that takes shapes in different contexts, as Nigat was saying as well. So I come from Brazil, for instance, and this type of intervention clearly serves there as a means to show dissatisfaction, as somebody pointed out in the beginning of our panel, yeah. uh, or to directly attack democratic institutions, in particular the electoral system and high courts. Um, so I think we do have um, this uh, varied, but, but not a complete enough mm -hmm. conceptual framework. And I'm just going to say one very quick last thing. I, I, I don't think there's space in statutory regulation for a concept of disinformation. Well, but I'm about to about move that. on. I'm going to ask yeah. you about regulation <laughs> next. So uh, Bill, you want to react. Is it about the, the opening segment, or do you want to actually talk about regulation? I just want to uh, surprise Jeanette by agreeing with her strongly, <laughs> because we've been arguing about this for a while. Um, <laughs> No, I, I mean, I just want to emphasize again, and this is why I said at the outset that I, I was kind of in the middle and it depends on context and so on. There are indeed lots of people who will say they, be, they believe in disinformation because of tribal loyalty. Yeah. There's no question about that in the American case. And indeed, uh, one of the things that's really happened, and this goes also to your like not believing in truth versus fiction, uh, you know, they not believing there's a boundary. There's a lot of people who have just built their identity around giving the finger to the other side. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, you know, if you if you hear a lot of people when they interview people at Trump rallies and they say they, they believe this stuff and the, somebody asks them, you know, but you saw this and they go, yeah, well, whatever. Screw that. The libs don't want us to, to think this, you know, so so it's all about owning the libs, owning the other side, giving the finger to the people you don't identify with. And so there's, there's like a pretense in a way. of So it does mean that it's harder to disentangle. It doesn't mean that it's not a, a vibrant, important part of the mix. It just means, is it directly causal, is a little bit more complex. Thanks. I want to ask everyone in the room, is, is there anyone here who lives in a context where disinformation is not particularly prominent or influential? Anyone? Just come and tell us a bit about it. Just come to the mic and tell us where, where you're from and, and why. You think that's the case? Well, <laughs> hello everyone. Uh, well, I'm from Switzerland. Um, I wouldn't say that it's not a problem 
whatsoever, but I also wouldn't say that it has the ability to sway entire elections. We have a multi-party system, for example. Uh, people tend to vote for the same parties for the last 30 years, so <laughs> not much has happened uh, in that respect. Of course, we had the same challenges with COVID uh, as, as everyone else, but uh, I, I think I will be exaggerating massively to say that this is the topic um, for us to focus on. Well, it's really good to get a, a Global North perspective. I'm from South Africa, and I can say that disinformation is not a major problem in South Africa. Believing the government is a major problem. Um, but, but, but what, so there is often, there's often engagement in the media about whether information is false or accurate. But we've got very well self-regulated media that deals with disinformation, and the public tends to participate in that. So fact-checking is something that happens on a daily basis very quickly. So a politician will make a statement on television one night, the next day the media will fact-check it. And, and the public does tend to believe the media, and what we find quite unique or interesting is that whether it's right-wing center or left-wing media, there is a common commitment across that spectrum to, to accuracy, which we think is because our media, uh, the self-regulation actually works. So for us, it's also not a, a, a major concern. I want to move on to, to the next question, in a way at the heart of why we convened this workshop. By the way, the three of us argued a lot in the, in the course of, of this workshop uh, planning and design. So it, it, it's for us also not a, a clear issue. But really the heart of this is it's at the IGF and it's about governance. Um, do you think that we have, do you think we can regulate this information effectively internationally? Um, we know there's a lot of national uh, initiatives that are, that are being put in place and that are quite controversial. Um, and what do you think, do, you, do we have the baseline? Do we have a strong and clear baseline um, that existing international instruments can provide for the governance of disinformation? And if we move in this direction of, of international governance of disinformation, what are the implications for access to information and, and freedom of, of expression? Um, David, can I ask you to start us on that? I know this is something you have applied your, your thought and your expertise and experience to. Yeah, thanks, Henriette. I, um, so my, my view is that global regulation of disinformation, if we think of that as a concrete set of rules that will guide decision makers in every context and will have kind of a global oversight is a chimera. That's, that's not, we're not going to achieve that and it's not worth, in my view, even trying to achieve it. What, what I do think is that governments and platforms and media outlets need a common set of principles to guide how they think about this and how they react to it. And to my mind, I mean, this would be no surprise um, to people, at least who know my work, I think that those principles are rooted in human rights law. And there's very, very good reason because we're talking about information, the sharing of information, the possibility of making it harder for individuals to find accurate information. We need to have standards that are based in uh, Article 19 on principles of legality, necessity and proportionality and legitimacy of the objective. And I think that, and I'll, just to end here, I think that there is a way in which uh, resourcing human rights mechanisms in particular and by that, I don't mean the Human Rights Council, but rather the Human Rights Committee, regional human rights courts and others, resourcing them, ensuring that they have the tools to answer questions when individuals feel that their government is interfering with their right of access to information by either disinforming themselves or permitting disinformation in one way or another, that those kinds of tools can be a mechanism for global governance, but not in the maybe IGF sense of what 
internet governance looks like. Thanks, David. And Clara. Um, yeah, so I really enjoy thinking about this question. Um, it was really provoking to me. Um, I am not sure about the extent to which global governance solutions can help us. And I'll try to summarize this very briefly in two points. Uh, first, because I feel this urge to look at this information, uh, this information's role in political disputes, and it becomes clear to me that countermeasuring it or mitigating it is not only about a communication practice in itself, um, if it's being used by certain political and economic interests that have been shaping our societies for so long, then mitigating this information is also about confronting ourselves with these broader issues. So to stick with the Brazilian case, I think about the ultimate convertibility of economic power in political power. And that includes a traditionally concentrated and unregulated media landscape, especially compared when compared with other Western democracies. Um, so I think that would, that, that certainly needs to be a part of the conversation. Uh, but even in the interest of getting more granular, um, it's okay, it's fair to say we need some action that targets this information specifically as well. And here, I'm afraid I'm also skeptical because global solutions mostly presume consensus-based governance structures, or as David put very well, at least uh, global governance in the IGF sense of things, um, does not include uh, an authority enforcement, right? And I think even though it offers us very interesting guidelines, human rights standards, uh, I'm afraid the confirmation of current digital business models and data usages will need more than that, to mention a few things that should be on the regulatory agenda. Thanks. And, and Nigat, do you feel we've got the, the instruments needed? Um, or how do I you feel about the idea of global governance of disinformation? Yeah, I mean, everything that has been said by David and Clara, I, I agree with that. I, I think we already have global governance instruments with us in terms of several principles or you know conversations that have taken place resolutions and all of that um, but i think we also need to see what actors have learned out of those uh instruments and tools that we have globe which have been developed globally uh, i don't think powerful actors have learned that if you look at uh national policies, regulations, and laws that are being uh, uh, drafted and introduced not only in global majority, but also in global north, uh, those policies have this appetite of suppressing freedom of expression, right? I don't think that they are able to identify how certain content uh, uh, can actually cause real, uh, real uh, uh, world harm. And, and what David basically said that, you know, like especially state actors have this, not only companies, but state actors also have this obligation under human rights standards to, uh, uh, to provide accurate information and prevent misinformation. I mean, we have Rabat uh, plan of action. We have so many instruments out there. I think it's, we really need to see how different components that are already out there can complement each other and do not work in silos. Uh, there are several, and you know, we'll be talking about you know those governance mechanisms. You have already mentioned this, like certain, uh, you know, like for oversight board or other things that are already out there. How those are performing? Are we really, you know, looking into the performance? What they are adding into the certain uh, our existing ecosystem? So I think uh, we already have so much. I think we just we just need to know how to use that. Thanks, um, thanks for that, Nika. Jeanette. Yeah, thank you, Andriette. Um, the whole question reminds me of the early days of internet governance when it was always clear that uh, protocol standards uh, for the infrastructure we had to agree upon to have a global network, but the upper layers, uh, particularly content, that should not be done on a global level. 
Having said that, there is one aspect I'd like to mention that um, I find quite interesting in this context, and this is the Digital Service Act that the uh, European Commission just agreed upon and that will um, take effect uh, early next year. And that DSA has one aspect that, at least from a German perspective, is really interesting. It concerns the scope of human rights. Um, at least in Germany, traditionally, human rights regulate the relationship between citizens, or say people, and the government. But the DSA mentions at several uh, points that human rights should also guide the behavior of platforms, meaning the scope of human rights begins to integrate also private sector action because it affects to such an extent our conditions and possibilities to exercise human rights. So this is an interesting development uh, and we can think about extending that to other jurisdictions or world regions. And actually I would like to know what our other panelists think about that. Thanks. Well, Bill, do you want to react to that before we go to Aaron has now joined us, so we'll hear from him next. No, I don't want to react to that. I want to say something else. Go ahead. You okay. can. So um, the question, I mean, the way the question is posed, can it be effective? Probably not. I think we have to engage it on the long term anyway. We have to try to build up the operational and normative infrastructure to continually challenge disinformation. But of course, obviously, to believe that it's going to effectively regulate it at the global level is a, a little bit far-fetched, but we have to try. That said, I think it's worth just highlighting because this is the Internet Governance Forum. We're trying to talk about uh, disinformation from an Internet governance standpoint. Some of the things that are happening internationally, I just want to flag a couple of quick things. One is the, U, the UN discussions around cybercrime and cybersecurity. In those contexts, you've seen a lot of proposals, a lot of language that pertains to disinformation, and it demonstrates the difficulty of trying to do this in a multilateral level in a geopolitically divided environment. So for example, in the cyber uh, crime treaty negotiations going on now, China proposed language saying that all governments should adopt laws saying uh, uh, calling a spread of disinformation a criminal uh, offense. And uh, they described it as anything that uh, makes available false information that could result in serious social disorder. Well, again, what could result in serious social disorder is obviously in the eyes of the beholder. Then we have, secondly, the UNESCO guidelines for the regulation of digital platforms, which UNESCO hopes to finalize this year. That has some language in it that is germane to uh, disinformation as well, and the model of adopting guidelines or suggesting guidelines to countries, you know, there's the possibility that some countries will implement those guidelines uh, in ways that are restrictive of uh, freedom of expression and will claim international legitimacy in doing so. So the question of guidelines versus treaties is an issue. The last thing I would just mention, the UN Secretary General is now proposing a code of conduct for information integrity on digital platforms. This is part of the global digital compact uh, discussions, and he wants to have this discussed at the, the summit in, in the futures. And if you've seen the document, uh, he proposes a, uh, a, a global set of guidelines uh, drawing on the UNESCO experience that is based on nine principles, many of which are pretty much focused on platforms and how platforms behave and how stakeholders behave. This is, you know, it's easy, I think, to say, well, platforms have to adopt rules about transparency, disgorging information, allowing uh, scholars to access the data, and so on. It's a lot harder to say states should not uh, disseminate this kind of information in the first place, or all stakeholders must abide by good taste and common sense. Those things are a little bit hard to achieve, particularly through guidelines, but that's what the Secretary General is doing, and uh, he's actually calling also for the establishment of a, quote, dedicated capacity in the UN Secretariat to monitor and advance all of this, which is an interesting thing. So, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about whether new organizational structures will be built through the Global Digital Compact, particularly in New York, uh, and this is one where I think they might get some political traction in saying there ought to be a centralized mechanism for at least tracking progress in addressing these issues, uh, uh, tracking progress in adopting complementary kinds of guidelines, and so on. So we'll see. But so there's a lot going on at the international level. 
and I think it's worth talking about that. Thanks, thanks. Um, Aaron, Aaron Maniam, you are with us now. Um, please introduce yourself and tell us what you think about this global governance response to disinformation. Thanks so much, Henrietta. Apologies for joining you a little bit late. I had some technical challenges, which I suppose are unironic, given that this is, you know, a panel at the IGF. And I'm calling in from Oxford, that panel, you know, that, that capital of the world in internet connectivity. So uh, apologies to everyone. I'm glad I, I got here now. Um, I love this question on global governance because I think it gets to the nub of many just of the tell, core uh, issues. Erin, just tell us a little bit more. I know you're an academic now, but we were particularly interested on your views based on your perspective as, as being within government. Mm, of course, sure. Uh, I, until recently, I was a policymaker in Singapore uh, working on, on digital issues, you know, covering both how governments can enable digital in the economy and society, but also what sorts of international partnerships governments need to embark on and the kinds of regulation that we need to do both in the economic sphere as well as on, on content. Um, so I think this is a real you know, commingling of, of many of the challenges that any government faces. Um, and on the global front, I, I just I wanted to make four points, which I think you know, all germane to this discussion. The first is we have to figure out even what we mean by global governance. Right? There are so many models. There are de minimis models where it's kind of a very basic level of, of guidelines that get set out and, and very, very little else in terms of enforcement or monitoring capacity. But then we have maximal models as well, things like the ICAO has managed to achieve because we know that there are clear risks and safety issues that are involved. Um, and, and at the moment, you know, we see emerging examples like those Bill mentioned, the open-ended working group on cyber at the UN is trying to achieve a greater set of consensus on some of these issues. Um, and, and it's really not clear where we're going to land, I think, in terms of the de minimis or more maximal models of, of global governance. As a result, uh, just second point that I think is important here is I think it's really important to differentiate between the basic standards and the, the kind of more additional sets of, of, of issues that we want to cover in a set of global governance um, regulations. Uh, Jeanette referred to this, and I think examples like the DSA are really important. Right? In Singapore, the online, we have a, a set of online safety regulations. The UK, we know, has put that out recently as well. And I think it's useful to ask if beyond the basic, you know, we were not able to get to a level of consensus yet, what is useful is that the guidelines that Bill mentioned or any further you know, kinds of regulatory principles that are put in place must at least be interoperable amongst different countries. They don't need to be identical, but interoperability allows for different systems to at least talk to each other in a much more coherent way. Um, two last points that I think are also important that we haven't quite named in this discussion. The first is I think one major challenge in this work is going to be the fact that in some cases, governments are the source of mis or disinformation rather than the entity that is going to regulate it. Um, and, and that makes it much more difficult for those sorts of systems to be working with others where governments act in more rational um, information, uh, misinformation, dis uh, minimizing sort of ways. And we've, we need to be able to differentiate the two and not let that, that first group of, of governments actually end up holding us back on any kinds of coordination that we, we need to achieve. This will be hard, of course, right? because the tech itself is dynamic. Mm -hmm. In a sense, we're trying to play whack-a-mole here. I don't know if they, they call that... The, they call the game the same thing in every country, but you know, it's like a new problem comes up every few weeks and you have to find a new way to keep hitting it down. And the regulation has to keep evolving, but that also means that we need the skills within governments to keep that adaptation going, and we need the ability to continually mm -hmm. update our legislation uh, if we want to do this work well. That's not impossible. It can be done, but it means that parliamentary capacity is going to be stretched, not just executive capacity, because we're going to constantly be going back and up, having to update and refine and making our laws more agile and, mm -hmm. and adaptive. Not easy, but I think those are the kinds of challenges we'll have to mm -hmm. deal with to realize the mm -hmm. sort of global governance that we would want. Thanks, thanks, Aaron. And, 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 and maybe, you know, maybe that interoperability is, you know, that takes us back to David, to, to whether human rights frameworks can provide that um, interoperability. Before I open to the audience, do, do any of the speakers want to react or comment on one another's inputs? So I want um, to open it. Sorry, who, who is that? That was yeah, that? Nigat. Go for it, Nigat. Yeah. And yet I just wanted to 
uh, before we move ahead, I think one part of this conversation that is missing is we are talking about global governance, but uh, for some reason, I always raise this in several panels and it kind of, you know, like, uh, it kind of get lost in the conversation. And that basically is that how to hold those governments accountable who actually uh, use these guidelines for their own interest and benefit and make laws and regulations mm -hmm. where they can control uh, uh, content on um, in their own uh, sovereign jurisdictions, but then they are not accountable that what are the wrongdoings that they are doing. So I feel like that, yes, regulation, regulatory mechanisms are good, but how to hold those state actors accountable? And I have had these conversations where many global global north actors are like but those governments will do this anyway then we should be all go like we should should we leave them behind should we leave the, those users behind like how we will take them along with us i think this is the question that i always raise it and it frustrates me a lot thanks nikat i share i share that bill you want to react quickly to this no actually when i, I want to ask the other panelists for their perspective I'd like to know if anybody has views. I'm looking at some of the people we have online. Uh, has it, any opinion on the Secretary General's proposal? Since this is a, an important thing, the Secretary General of the United Nations is proposing a code of conduct on information integrity for digital platforms. That mm -hmm. would seem to be an instance of an attempt at global internet governance. It's governing information that goes over the network that's it's within the definition of internet governance. So I'd like to know how people uh, view this initiative, what they, what they think of it in terms of its potential impact, how well it's crafted, et cetera. Um, do you want to comment on that, any, any one of you? Just jump in if you do. I'll say, I'll say something just very, very briefly about it because I do think it's, it's a very important topic. I, I'll say two things, one, I'm, um, I think the process has been interesting, but I am not sure that civil society has played as active a role in helping shape the document as should be the case. And, um, and so there's a process issue at the outset. And as, as we look forward to the actual negotiation of an adopted or to be adopted text, if civil society is not in the room, if civil society is not in the places where there's actual drafting and adoption taking place, I think the legitimacy of the outcome uh, will, be, uh, will be suspect. So that's a process response. A substantive response is that I, I'm concerned that it focuses um, not exclusively, but in an, um, perhaps an over-reliant way on platforms. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely a, uh, a major role of platforms in the problem of disinformation, but any process that excludes, as we heard from the situation in the Philippines or the United States, that excludes a call for governments themselves to be better behaved, mm -hmm. to be supporting and um, resourcing public service media, public broadcasting, any avoidance of that will, I think, make the process mm -hmm. sort of at its core, mm -hmm. um, not useless, but um, will really detract from its, mm -hmm. from its value. Thanks very much, David. I'm actually going to move to the audience now, and I, I'm going to open with the, the, the question that actually I'm going to ask the panel to, to respond to as well, which is that if we are going to develop governance initiatives to respond to disinformation, um, how do we do it? David just um, pointed out the, the, the risks of a, a fairly top-down process such as the one that's coming from the Secretary General's office. Um, so how do you consult? Um, how do you make decisions about um, governance responses to disinformation in a way that will be effective? So I'm opening this question to people in the room and also if you have any questions for the panelists or contributions, um, please stand up, take the mic and um, introduce yourself first. 
Farzana, you can go ahead. Oh, thank you. My name is Farzana Badi from Digital Medusa. First of all, congratulations on a nuanced and evidence-based discussion on disinformation. This has been lacking from IGF this year, and uh, I think you remedied that with this uh, panel. Uh, disinformation uh, governance can become indeed an internet governance issue if we rush towards solutions that could affect internet infrastructure. And by talking uh, without uh, evidence, by talking about disinformation and how harmful it is and rushing to govern and regulate it, we are going to uh, see that it affects connectivity. And it has actually happened when uh, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, Europe decided to do IP blocking of, web, uh, of websites of Russia that were spreading disinformation. So it is indeed an internet governance issue. And we need to, and in, in, at IGF, we need to have an absolutely more nuanced approach to the discussion and uh, not rush to um, any uh, conclusion. And as uh, Nigat said, we also have been active in uh, coming up with solutions uh, anyway. But so I think that that's one point that it can be an internet governance uh, issue and we need to monitor that. And the other is that uh, disinformation is also uh, something that in declarations like G7, they mention it, they commit to open global internet, but they also talk about tackling the, uh, disinformation, which like, but our solutions to fight with disinformation should not affect connectivity and internet infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks, Farzi. Wolfgang. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a retired professor from the University of Aarhus, and I can only support what Fasene has just said. Uh, we always risk in this debate to undermine the fundamental right to freedom of expression as laid down in Article 19 of the Human Rights Declaration. And, uh, you know, as a member of the old generation, I'm asking myself a little bit, what's really new here? So I went through the Cold War, and the Cold War was an information war. So if it goes back 500 years when Gutenberg invented the printing press, so the Catholic Church were excited, then somebody used it to write anti-Catholic pamphlets, and because the Pope said there's a misuse of technology. And then the struggle started, you know, who is right, who is wrong. So the, the critics of the Catholic Church, or is the Pope wrong, right, and they had the index of censorship. So it's very close if we continue the debate that you end up with a censorship regime. So, and, and uh, the tragedy is, also look at Germany in the 1930s. So uh, Mr. Goebbels, who was the Minister for Propaganda in the Third Reich, so he did see radio as a weapon. He said it's like a machine gun. And people loved him. So millions of Germans, you know, believed in uh, uh, what, what, what this crowd of criminals said to, to, the, to the public. And the tragedy is we know all this, that uh, complex, uh, simple answers to complex answers, uh, to, to complex questions are given by either idiots or liars. So, but the problem is that a bunch of people love idiots and they love liars. So that means what you can do with this. So that means you have to invest more in education, creating awareness, you know, to enable people that they understand the context. So I think context is one way forward. So that you have, if you have bad information, the best thing is to have more good information so that you can rebalance this and, 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 and not to cancel it or to censor it or something like that. So I think the, uh, uh, Janet mentioned the Digital Service Act. That's one step in the right direction. We have the Facebook Oversight Board. You know, it's an effort, but I'm also very critical. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see we have a problem, 
but I do not have a solution. And I think in 20 years, we will discuss, you know, what could be the solution for this problem. So we have to go with very small steps to identify where we can uh, minimize the uh, negative side effects of this disinformation. You, you will not be able to remove it. So, and, you know, one idea I have is, since years, so in the, in the ICANN context, we have uh, the uh, dispute resolution mechanism for domain names. So the UDRP system allows a broad system on a case-by-case -case basis to go through cases taking into account uh, regional context and, and individual constellation. And 80, 90% of content-related conflicts in the internet are relevant for the region and the cultural context and the, the, the involved parties. So that means why not to think about a distributed um, uh, system where you, on a case-by-case -case basis, who uh, goes through certain um, um, issues. And, and this could create a yeah. body of understanding what is, what is bad and what is good. So that means these are the, then the voluntary guidelines could ask competent, so best practice or something like that. So I fully agree with David that he said, you know, uh, you know a, a top-down regulation will never work. We have Article 19, we have Article 19.3, we know how the the, the, the uh, national security, public order, public health, and, 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 and moral uh, as possible restrictions are misused by governments. But this is not a governance issue for the IGF. This is a national issue for national policy making. And in so far, we should debate this on the, in the IGF, but we should not expect that we will find a solution. Thank you. Thanks, Wolfgang. I just, just want to make one point, though. I think. I do think we have to recognize that the weaponizing of disinformation is very different now from what it was when you had to have to, con to do it via radio, to do it via bro broadcasting um, uh, platforms. You needed to have some kind of political power or economic power. Um, in online platforms, it's much more distributed, that ability to, to weaponize uh, disinformation. And I think that is a challenge we cannot ignore. So yes, there are similarities, but there are also differences. Um, I see, um, Cor, where you want to have the floor, but I wanted to know if there was anyone from the Christchurch call in the room who might be willing to share how they approached consultation, <coughs> because I think that is an important part of what we're trying to address with this workshop, to find effective ways of getting towards governance, governance ignitions. So please go ahead, Kowe. I have two comments. The first comment actually is, um, I really question about you know, the UN Direct General. Uh, his uh, saying is really can get a consensus or, or any respect from the the state, you know, the different state, because, uh, well, how 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 he can how he can act that, and eventually the state agree upon, and that is uh, difficult. And the second one actually is a question because we are talking about this disinformation, because we are living in a luxury democratic system, or some of us, some of us. We have a democratic system. Uh, we allow you, you know, even the disinformation you can debate. Let me ask a simple question. If this disinformation, most of that, or maybe 80% of that, is uh, distributed by government, in that kind of environment, can you tell me how the people can react to that? Because the, inf the disinformation is not from people, it's from government or from politicians. Then what, what are we going to do? Thanks, go away. Nigat made that point. Um, anyone else from the audience before we go back to the, to the Christchurch? Did you want to, Paula, you gonna, do you want to say something about it? I know it's a slightly different topic, but I think that what you did was in terms of the consultation process, maybe if you could just say a little bit about, about how you approached finding solutions through consultation. And apologies for putting you on the spot like this, but. It's okay, I'm often put on the spot. I'm just 
just used to taller microphones than this. Um, <laughs> thank you, um, and we um, yeah, I'm just trying to think through the various different layers. Um, the Christchurch School has been through a bit of a journey. For those who don't know much about it, it was started in 2019. And just introduce yourself, please. Yeah, sorry, I'll go back a layer. Um, kia ora tato katoa. My name's Paul Ash. I'm the Prime Minister's spe Special Representative on Cyber and Digital from New Zealand. Um, I also lead the team in the New Zealand end of the New Zealand French Secretariat leading the Christchurch call. For those who aren't familiar with the call, it was stood up after the terrorist attacks in two mosques in Christchurch in March 2019 when the murder of 51 uh, worshippers was live streamed around the world, amplified algorithmically and found its way, I'm sure, into many of your um, social media feeds and inboxes. And rather than um, uh, let that stand, we took a deliberate approach to working with companies, seeing um, them, governments and civil society as stakeholders in the process of trying to build solutions to prevent that happening again. And as we did that, we negotiated a set of 25 commitments that was done uh, in rather a hurry uh, through eight weeks, but actually those commitments have proved very durable as we've looked to the implementation of them. As we went through that eight-week process, we met with civil society groups. At that point, uh, we were not in a space of a full multi-stakeholder construct, in part because we wanted to capture the moment and make sure that we fed that and put in, put a placeholder in the Christchurch call text in order to enable full participation uh, thereafter um, and get those commitments landed uh, at a meeting in Paris in, in May 2019. Uh, thereafter, we've worked on the process of implementing specific commitments around things like live streaming, um, around um, uh, the ability to detect and deal with terrorist and violent extremist content, uh, and increasingly recently focusing in on issues like algorithmic amplification, like user journeys and the pathway to radicalisation to violence. And it's probably in that area that there are some significant connections to the topic of dis and misinformation and its distribution, uh, and certainly there is... Um, a good body of evidence showing that uh, the amplification of disinformation messages can lead to radicalisation to violence. The, the approach we've taken since then around consultation has been uh, over the period of 2019 to build up and, and establish um, a civil society uh, advisory network uh, that works with the Christchurch Call uh, partners and over time to broaden that out to develop what we call the Christchurch Call community in which all of those involved, whether they're in the advisory network, whether they're a partner, whether they're a government or an online service provider, supporter, uh, can contribute to a discussion on all of the different pieces of policy and problem solving that the Christchurch Call is working on. Over the course of a year, um, we work on those through specific working groups and work streams that the Christchurch Call leaders um, ask us to, to, to focus in on. And each year we hold a Christchurch Call summit where heads of government, heads of tech firms, heads of civil society organisations consider the outputs from that and give direction around the work that we will take forward in the subsequent year. It's a different subject matter set from dis and misinformation. We've been very careful to distinguish um, um, the subject areas. What I would say is keeping scope really tight has been one of the things that has enabled the Christchurch call to make progress. Uh, we, it's not a call about child sexual abuse material or body image or a range of other things. It's, it's focused in on one specific subject area. And I think um, having a secretariat that at times is able to build trust across participants to work quietly on issues that can be really contentious is also a very, very important lesson that we've taken from this. But the most important, I think, analogue that could be drawn um, and, and brought over into the area of dis and misinformation is the... the the strength of a fully multi-stakeholder model. We've looked at many, many different multi-stakeholder configurations that might be governments and civil society, tech and civil society, tech and governments. Having that mix all in a room together is actually incredibly difficult. You, you get aspects of the three-body problem working at times, and that can be really complicated to deal with. Uh, but it does mean that there's a process of building trust and um, um, becoming, as we put it, um, are comfortable having uncomfortable discussions. And I think that's one of the most important things to learn. Over time, we've had to systematise that a bit more. And as it's grown, one of the hardest things to do is actually maintain that trust across the community. So there's a useful lesson there for any other multi-stakeholder governance construct. 
but I'll stop there because that's probably more information than you needed. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that. But I think it's very useful because I think it's the, it's about the, 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 the depth of the process, the fact that it takes time, that it takes time to establish a process that's going to help you respond effectively to a problem. And then I think the focus, you know, maybe we talk about disinformation, but, but maybe disinformation about sexual and reproductive health is very different from disinformation about elections. You know, so, but so now to go back to the panel, um, you know, Bill, I'm gonna start with you. You know, this, this question about how to approach the consultation, the decision-making process to respond to this uh, from a governance perspective. You keep asking me questions that I don't want to answer. I want to do something else. Okay, then to, I'll go to someone else. <laughs> I want to reply. No, you, don't, you can answer the question that you want to answer. I want to reply to, to David and Gawe uh, on, on points they made real quick. Uh, Gawe was talking about the governments being the source of things. This goes back to what I was saying about the, the, the Secretary General's initiative. You know, in December 21, uh, the General Assembly had a resolution on countering disinformation which recalled, reaffirmed, recognized, highlighted, expressed concern for, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and asked for the Secretary General to do a report. He did a report the next year, uh, August 20, 2022, uh, and said, uh, the one of the big conclusions, states bear the primary responsibility to counter disinformation by respecting, protecting, and fulfilling their rights to freedom of opinion and expression, to privacy, and public participation, and called for a multifaceted approach anchored in the protection and respect for human rights. And now what are we doing, what's he doing in response to that? Uh, guidelines for platforms. Because the reality is, it's pretty hard for the United Nations to have any kind of really constructive process around governments being the source of much of the disinformation that matters because governments reserve the rights under the UN Charter to do whatever the hell they want and they're not gonna be constrained. So instead, we focus on the platforms. I agree that the platforms have some issues. I agree that you know, it would be useful to try to encourage greater transparency, et cetera, et cetera, in the platforms. But that's not, you know, telling Facebook that they have to do something because Russia used Facebook to disseminate information does not address the fact that Russia is disseminating, disseminating information. And it's not just, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, and uh, you know, uh, um, what am I trying to say, uh, you know, YouTube. There, there, there's so many different sources of disinformation and the dark web and so on. It's an incredibly robust environment. It's a commercial marketplace. People create this stuff. You can go online on the dark web and hire people to generate disinformation using bots and so on and so forth. So I mean, it's not just, you know, you can adopt rules for a few of those platforms, it's not gonna solve the thing. The other point I just wanted to make real quick was that David said we need greater uh, civil society participation in the Secretary General process. This is why I, I brought it up. Here we are at the IGF, we're having almost no discussion around the various things that are being proposed through the Secretary General under the Global Digital Compact. There's been, I've been to many sessions. We're not, we're not doing it. We're not taking advantage of the opportunity to say we, the stakeholders, not just civil society, but all stakeholders, demand right to be heard and weigh in on these processes. Nobody knows where this is being done and how it's being done. It's just outreach to a small set of players. That's something has to change there. Now, there is a sense. I haven't heard anyone use the concept yet of disinformation panic, but I think there is a bit of a, of a sense that um, that 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 multi-stakeholder and self-regulatory processes aren't dealing with it. Therefore, the parents have to come and and step in, and we need governmental regulation. And I think, well, certainly in my view, I'm not saying that there isn't a need for regulatory response, but it does feel as if we are leaping. To, to that response before we've actually explored um, more bottom-up ways. Jeanette, what is your view? Um, when it comes to what we should do, I'd like to go back to the Digital Service Act. It's paragraph 40, um, has a provision that uh, gives regulators, but also vital for me, researchers access to data from platforms uh, 
in the area of what is called system, uh, systemic risks caused by platforms. I'm not so happy about this restriction that we have to sort of mobilize systemic risk um, as a concept to get access, but the fact that we now will get access to data that help us understanding uh, in a better, uh, more evidence-based way of what this information does, also how many people it actually reaches, we don't know much of that, right? We have only vague data from the US and Europe saying it's sort of between 0.4 and 5% uh, of the people, of the users of platforms actually get to see this information. There are better times lying ahead of us with getting access, and I hope that the IGF could be a mechanism where we can sort of uh, provide best practices of how to actually implement this Article 40, and I hope that also small jurisdictions will pick this up and say, here, you are giving people access in Europe, why don't you give us access in other countries? IGF could be a way to sort of discuss this. Yes, it's very important to note that this access to data is not available to researchers in the Philippines or, or in Brazil um, or in you know, other instances where there, where is the need to look at the impact and how it operates, how disinformation operates. Um, Aaron, what is your view on this, on, on how we develop these, these responses? And particularly, I would like to, to, to respond on the role of government because I think we, we are in a moment where governments are taking this very seriously. Um, I think sometimes with good intentions, not always with, with bad intentions. Yeah. No, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that. I think I broadly agree with the thrust of the discussion so far that you know, this work needs to be polycentric. It's not just about having multiple people involved, but there needs to be leadership and decision capacity in multiple centers of power and influence. And that means that governments move from just having an authority-based uh, role to having a convening function. And that, you know, it means governments bring together the right players. It means governments have to acquire skills in facilitation, in interest aggregation, potentially even in conflict mediation, in order to allow for emerging consensus to actually distill itself. Uh, in Singapore, we've been doing a lot of this consultative, you know, deliberative work in, in, in terms of the kinds of bottom-up democracy um, that we've been calling Forward Singapore in its most latest incarnation. It's just how are we looking to build a future identity for, for the country? During COVID, there was a process of thinking about recovering and emerging stronger together as well. And it's something that we've been experimenting with for a good part of the last 20 years, right? How we build this bottom-up uh, set of, of, of priorities and, and issues. Um, but as a kind of side note to that, but a very important side note, I think even where government itself is thinking about its role right, in, in relation to the private sector as well as civil society, it's really important to harness the range of roles, not just the regulatory uh, functions and the lawmaking functions that we have, but also the, the, the possibility of governments in community building, in space building, in urban planning, because a lot of the solutions might actually lie in there. Uh, one thing I was, I was very struck by in my last job, for instance, is that the three agencies that worked together with the ministry in operationalizing strategy right, were the Information and Media Development Authority, the Cybersecurity Agency, and the National Library Board. Right? So we have a board that looks after all of our national libraries. And it's really interesting because when you think about it, we've talked a lot about regulation. We've talked a lot about the dark aspects of security and how we want to respond to that. But we haven't talked about the literacy that our citizens need as in a, with as much detail. And if you ask me, I think schools and libraries are as important players in this whole process as the, you know, the, the more regulatory counterparts that they might have in government. This isn't always obvious to us because this is where you know, the patience is, comes in, right, Andrea? It takes time to build up literacies. But I think that's where we need to start, right? I look at my, my one-year-old nephew who knows how to swipe on an iPad even before he can talk his literacies are going to be very different from the literacies that all of us have had to develop over time. But I think we need to bring our libraries, bring our schools, and bring our family discussions into this a lot more, because that's where some of those core literacies and, and moral uh, sensibilities will start to get laid. Yeah. Thanks, um, Clara. We, we have uh, three minutes left, so let's move quickly. And then I'm still going to come back to the panel for their takeaways. Clara, keep it brief, please. 
Okay, so I am so I'm going to second Jeanette on a call for more empirical evidence, especially outside of the global north. Um, I'll stick to Brazil to tell you, for instance, that we all know that Latin American countries have another sort of relationship with messaging apps, for instance. In Brazil, this is aggravated by zero rating policies, where for a huge majority of the population, the intranet equals WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram. So this just shows you how we need more data in order to understand how all these political social contingencies that we can see actually play into the way this information behaves. Very briefly to our promise, and yet I think we need more institutional innovation in the sense of among all the things that we need to find this information, there's a lot that is up for governments, but there's this one thing that is disputing the truth, disputing content, and that should definitely be um, with civil society. It should be with different agents. And I think we need the institutional apparatus to allow for that to happen. Thanks. So Clara has actually already done her what she wants to see and what she doesn't want to see. Mm -hmm. Nigat, what about you? Yeah, Andrew, I actually, to go back to your point where you said that uh, we sometimes, you know, quickly want to get into, a, you know, other solutions. And I feel that the ones that we have, we really need to look into the nuance that those solutions have established. Of course, like it or not, you know, some solutions, all solutions have pros and cons. Uh, but you, to your point about the consultation, one thing that I have learned sitting at the board is that we are talking about context a lot, but we really don't know how to extract that context, you know, when we are deciding about something. And at the board, what we have done is speaking to civil society from that particular region, you know, uh, where we have selected that case from. And I think that's the kind of process that we need. We need more global oversight board. We don't need only one because if regulation is doing something from the state perspective, we need these boards to also hold these companies accountable and do their work. Our transparency reports are there, our decisions are there. I think those also give really good data point, data sets to researcher to hold these platforms more accountable. Thanks, Nikat. David. Yeah, I, I really appreciate um, that Paul Ash um, sort of made an intervention because I think that his leadership and New Zealand's leadership and the role of multi-stakeholder approaches, even in the wake, and let's remember the Christchurch call is, you know, could have gone the other direction. I mean, it was a moment of real trauma and people have a kind of natural response, as we're seeing right now in Israel and Palestine, a natural response to adopt uh, ideas that are not rooted in human rights. And the Christchurch call and Paul's, I think, stewardship of that had that at its core. And I think we need to find ways to ensure that that remains at the core of the global governance. IGF has not always been a place where human rights and access to information is front and center, but it can be. And I think there are a lot of people in this room or on this Zoom who believe in that. And there are models that we can draw from as we, as we move it forward. Thanks, David. So, Berlin Jeanette, you, you're gonna have the last word. And I want you to say the one thing that you'd like to see uh, taking this forward and the one thing you don't want to see. And be brief. Uh, one thing I let's start with the negative. The one thing I don't want to see is that governments use this sort of uh, global concern on disinformation as an excuse for regulating their people speaking up in public during a time where for the first time they can actually speak up. It's so important to, imp to support people and giving their opinion and exchanging their views and not, and not sort of primarily thinking of it in terms of regulating. That's the negative. The positive, I've always been an internet researcher with a focus on the internet. And over the last months, I begin to grasp the importance of high quality journalism. I want everybody to have the right to claim that the earth is flat, as long as there is good journalism that depicts 
the globe, right? So that shows and talks about it so that everybody can disseminate crap because it doesn't matter, it doesn't do harm to society as such. Good uh, uh, journalism and business model models that are also robust for the future that comes where the young generation doesn't subscribe to use uh, newspapers anymore but use social networks. We need to prepare for that time that the young generation doesn't pay anymore but depends on high quality journalism. Thanks. Nick, I'm just thanking you for saying that. Bill, you have the last word before me. I would like to see the European Union fine Elon Musk um, <laughs> substantially. Uh, they, 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 they've got the capacity under the Digital Services Act and their uh, guidelines. Uh, he has told them, screw you, I don't care what you think, and dropped out. Uh, I mean, I think governments are the main focus, but we have to do some stuff on the platforms, and making it hurt financially, especially vis-a-vis -vis the advertisers, is a good way to start. Thanks very much, and I'm sorry we went over time. I'm sorry we didn't have time to come back to our participants again, but thank you very much to all our panelists and our online participants and to the tech team and to RISPA. Um, and enjoy the rest of your IGF, and let's continue using the IGF to get to the, to the nux of these problems and to, 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 to unpack the misinformation about misinformation. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>